Good evening, folks. My name is Francis Colliato. I'm your Executive Director of Visual Communications and welcome to the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. I'm coming from you from our home in Long Beach and we acknowledge the Tongva, Kish, Chumash and, this, and the other peoples, the stewards of this land before we came to live here. On behalf of Visual Communications Board and staff, thank you for joining us as we continue to move forward and celebrating you and our communities as key contributors to 50 years of visual communications. Thank you to these artists for telling stories of truth. Through your works, know that you bring truth to power. Our deepest gratitude to our families, friends, and VC members, individual donors who continue to believe what we make happen. Thank you to Comcast, NBC Universal, Nielsen, sag After Producers, IACF, Warner Media, and HBO. Also, thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts, California Arts Council, the LA County Department of Arts and Culture, the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. And last uh, but not least, thank you to our funders, the Academy, Sundance Institute, the Getty Foundation, and the California Community Foundation, California Humanities, and Array. Thank you for your support. I'd like to thank our VC staff for your passion to create our ideal communities during this time. Um, I look forward to the day we can celebrate each other in person. Um, this festival is co-presented with our dozens of community partners who empower communities through media arts. I'd like to thank you everybody for their allyship. Tonight we center and highlight our friends immediately down south, Pacific Arts Movement and their upcoming San Diego Asian Film Festival starting tomorrow. Um, tonight we center their 2019 opening night film, The Paradise We Are Looking For and their amazing filmmakers. Come to think about it, this is the last film festival I attended in person and um, it makes me miss community even more. Um, thank you, Pet Guards, for your continued support and partnership. Congratulations, Brian, Kent, and the rest of the Pet Guards team on another film festival. And um, have a good one. Um, folks, I'd like to introduce you to our host and moderator of this panel, host and producer of many podcasts I can't even keep track of anymore. Please welcome festival programmer Marvin Yue. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Francis. Uh, my name is Marvin Yue. I am a programmer at uh, Visual Communications, um, helping with their features programming. Um, coming at you from San Gabriel, California, the ancestral, the ancestral home of the Tongva people. Um, it's always important because as um, immigrants, as our community are mostly immigrants, um, whether we're here by choice, by circumstance, or by force, um, it's always important to understand the histories of where we live and the lives that it took to build where we are today. So uh, yeah, let's get to our panel. Um, if you would like to read closed captions for um, the for the discussion today, there is a link in the chat that you can check out um, that you can read along with us as we go. Um, the Paradise, we're, looking, we're here today to talk about The Paradise We're Looking For, uh, which is a collection of four documentary shorts produced by our friends at Pacific Arts Movement, exploring San Diego's Exploring San Diego's unique culture from an Asian American lens through stories of community trauma, rituals, heritage, and personal histories. Um, so let's get started. Let's welcome our panelists, um, our filmmakers and producer. If you guys can all um, turn on your cameras so everyone can see your, your faces. Hey, everyone. <laughs> um, so let's get started with introductions. Uh, why don't you briefly tell us um, who you are and what your film is. And since we're talking about San Diego, which is a place that I lived in for almost seven, eight years, um, I would like to know also um, your favorite, let's say 2 a.m. Mexican joint um, after a night of partying. <laughs> um, let's start with uh, Quinn. Hi everyone, my name is Quinn. Uh, I'm the director of uh, the second film in our collection. Um, I hesitated for a second there. <laughs> um, and my favorite late night place to go in San Diego is Roberto's, specifically the one on El Cajon Boulevard, which is also where my film is set. <laughs> Next on my screen is Norbert. Hey guys, my name is Norbert Shea. I directed Two Miles East, uh, the first film in the Omnibus. And I guess my favorite place, I used to live around Claremont Mesa in San Diego, so it, it would be the Cody Hon that's like mm. tucked right by the gas station. Always a solid uh, choice. I think that was my first. I think so. <laughs> uh, Joseph. 
Hey everyone, I'm Joseph Manga. I directed uh, Bidioki. Um, I think it would have to, it's not the best place, but it's Super Sergio's in um, Sweetwater since that's where I went to high school a lot. Nice. So it has like a nostalgia. <laughs> My go-to is actually Super Sergio's on Convoy. So I think we're on the same wave mm. there. <laughs> um, and RJ. Hey folks, uh, my name is RJ Lozada. Uh, favorite spot is Armando's. Uh, it's just like a 10 minute walk from my house. Um, usually the first stop I make after I get picked up from the airport with my mom and dad. Nice. And um, Professor Brian, how about you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Brian Hu. I was one of the producers of this film. Um, I used to live in North Park. And I enjoyed walking to Colima's where you can get burritos the size of your arm. <laughs> Always great. Um, do it for the gram. Uh, so let's start this conversation with Brian, actually, as the producer and the artistic director at Pack Arts Movement. Um, you were integral to making this whole thing happen. Um, for people who don't know what an omnibus is, can you explain to us what it is and how it came together? Yeah, I mean, there's actually a long tradition of this, especially in Asian cinema, where sometimes you just have too many stories you want to tell. Um, and you can make short films, but uh, short films get more notice when they're sort of packaged as a feature. And so omnibus films have been a great way to get kind of like a diversity of different, especially new voices. Um, and so that's what we want to do with San Diego. We wanted to, to kind of pack as many directors that we love into one film and then for them to explore topics and themes and neighborhoods that meant something to them. Cool. So how did this project come together in terms of um, gathering all the voices and, and the stories? Like, did you, like, I'm unfamiliar with the process. So was it a big call out or did you commission these specifically? It was a little of both. Um, I mean, so, so as some people know, um, we also put on the San Diego Asian Film Festival. So we have this really nice privileged position to be able to know all the great filmmakers who have some connection with San Diego. And you're looking at them all now. I mean, these are our top choices um, of filmmakers who like films we've, we've shown in the past, um, some who have made films about San Diego, but some who have not, um, some who went to school here, some who grew up here. And, and we like the, the idea that everyone has different um, relationships to San Diego. And perhaps that also would have like the sense of whether it's nostalgia or sentiment or hardened like jadedness about San Diego all can come out um, through different perspectives. And so, and we just reached out to them. And the initial project was something to, something to do with history, but it doesn't have to be history. Um, and we really encouraged these filmmakers to think out of the box about what history can be for Asian Americans in San Diego, as well as what, like the form of documentary, like, what, what kind of form it can take on. So yeah, I was really encouraging them to think kind of experimentally about um, Asian American history in San Diego, but also about the documentary form. That's great. I mean, the, the Omnibus has a variety of styles and stories from a, very, a lot of different communities and a lot of different um, um, types of stories too. And so um, as someone, as a former resident, I did feel nostalgia uh, from all the sights and sounds. Um, but at the same time, I, I really appreciated how many different stories you can take from a place that I think in the greater scheme of like Asian American media or media in general is a place that isn't highlighted it often and is a place that's also near and dear to my heart as well as the heart of, hearts of all everyone involved. Um, so yeah, thanks for that, Brian. Um, we'll bring you back later on to um, talk a little bit more about um, the project and um, your upcoming festival. But um, let's get to the meat of this discussion. Let's talk to our filmmakers. Um, I guess to start off, if everyone can introduce their film and what it's about, um, we can go in order of the, the omnibus. So let's start with Norbert. My film's called Two Miles East, and it's a film essay that... Uh, takes a look at a tragic accident where an F-18 um, crashed into a university city home about 10, more than 10 years ago now, like almost 11, and um, kind of takes a look at the tensions of the military base in San Diego, uh, the air, air base, and also just the kind of that relationship civilians have with the military and the community um, and also just the effects of a tragedy in the 
like a city. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, Quinn? So the title of my film is The Morning Passing on El Cajon Boulevard. Uh, so it takes place mostly on El Cajon Boulevard. Uh, where the film follows Julie Tran or Julie Chang, who is a second generation Vietnamese American working in the funeral industry. And sort of, it's sort of a day in her life, but it's not the most uh, normal week of her life. Um, so I don't know if I'm supposed to give spoilers, but <laughs> it's about funerals. Um, I think spoilers are okay, right? Okay. I'm going to say sure. it's okay. <laughs> if anyone gets mad, it's on me. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay. Okay. I'll speak less vaguely. <laughs> um, Joseph, tell us about your film. Yeah, my my film's called Good Yogi, and it's about this um, karaoke restaurant in National City, and it's about the Filipino immigrants that um, frequent the place, um, and and them singing. <laughs> There's lots of great singing in that in that piece. Um, and RJ, tell us about your film. Yeah, my film's called Reunion 99. Uh, I kind of film around my 20th high school reunion, which coincidentally fell on uh, Pack Art Sadaf's 20th anniversary. Um, brings up like a lot of stuff uh, in me about the neighborhood uh, I grew up in, in Southwest side of San Diego. I feel like I have to say Southwest now because it's expanded over a number of years. Um, and yeah, so it's, yeah, it's more of a personal story. Awesome. Um, okay, so my first question here is for Norber. Let's go in order of the films. Um, I actually remember this incident because I lived in, I think in 2008, I lived in Mira Mesa, but I went to UC, UC San Diego. So I have a lot of friends who live in the new university city area. And that was where we did you know, the bulk of our, you know, um, probably legal house parties uh, back in the day. Um, and so I remember when this incident happened, I was frantically trying to get in contact with a lot of my friends there because, you know, we heard that the plane crashed, but we didn't know what happened. And I remember the story of the father who lost his mother-in-law, his wife and his newborn daughter and remember feeling really weird that he was so quick to forgive on the media and the whole media circus around it so when you're when i watched your film it just it brought back memories of that time but also memories of i remember when i lived in la jolla you know there was daily jets flying overhead every day military was a big presence even though it wasn't like visible all the time and so i guess my question to you is what drew you to this story specifically and um, why did you decide to, you know, tell the story, tell, tell this, make this film the way that you did through like indirect, like third party interviews? Right. Um, I, I guess one of the ways that I tried to approach the film was trying to be as respectful as I can to the family uh, and the community involved. I think we, we did try to reach out uh, to the family and they didn't want to be involved in the project, which uh, I understand. And so I decided to kind of broaden that story and look at it from the outside perspective. Um, like when, when that happened 10 years ago, I had just moved away from San Diego uh, to LA. So it happened really close to where I live. Like I, I lived in Claremont Mesa, right, you know, around convoy. So the base is just right there. So that I remember popping up as well. And um, I guess, you know, what struck me as I did some research about the story um, was just the way it was covered as an American story or an American dream, right? Like an American dream that was, uh, the, you know, the father had everything and he had his own restaurant, his own um, coffee shop and realized his dream. And that was just tragically taken away. Um, and that's just not something you think about. I mean, I think one of the things you're aware of is the dangers that could happen every day, but not necessarily something as absurd as a plane crashing. Like those are just a really tragic things that I think, uh, you know, in the back of the head, you're not gonna be considering. And so to see that play out in such a public manner, and then all of a sudden uh, the father just didn't talk to the media right after 
the press conference that he gave. So I was really interested in a little bit about his story about the family, but also just the circumstances of what created this incident. Um, and it's just like the factors of having a military base, suburban growth, um, you know, that tension was always there. It's always, you know, it's like the wildfires that are, that are in California, you know, it's a constant threat. And so, you know, how do you live with these things and how do you come to terms? And so a lot of that for me was told through kind of routine um, everyday vignettes. I wanted to kind of ground something in the film into these like small little vignettes of things happening, like just like the scene at the nursing home or just like the retail section at the Christmas store. These are all the small little tidbits about the family's own history, but also just to place it into, these are very tangible things for people and that this, these events could happen to anybody. Um, and it's also just such a complex thing of what happened with the plane and just the decisions that led the plane going to Mira Mesa rather than uh, Coronado. You know, there, there's just like trees of branches and decision paths that led it to exactly where it landed. So I felt the only way was to be more open about the storytelling process rather than really, you know, subjective. So. Yeah, I mean, I think you did it very well. I mean, you touched on, you know, broadening the scope to cover a lot of the different factors that led to the way that the story played out. I remember when the father was giving the interview about he forgave the pilot for what happened, like the media covered it as, oh, what a great Christian man. And I know like, you know, there were scenes at the church um, that you you portrayed in your film as well. Like, um, yeah, I mean, I think anyone who watches the film can, you know, get a sense of like a very uniquely San Diego thing where it's you're living whole currently with next to like what, three, four military bases where accidents happen all the time. And um, yeah, congrats on the, Congrats on, on the film. It's, it's really well done. Yeah. Um, next, I want to talk to Kewen, um about your film. Uh, I want, I'm going to say like your film kind of touched me in a different way. Like you know, the, the scenes of El Cajon was definitely nostalgic. I've definitely roamed those streets um, in my youth. But um, I had recently just lost my last grandparents. So I'd gone through my last round of, you know, mourning for that. And it's there's something interesting about the process of mourning and grief especially for diaspora Asians who like our parents are kind of the holders of our culture for a lot of us. We learn our heritage through observing them, but in times of like a funeral and mourning, even they're kind of at a loss, right? And, and then comes to, it becomes a responsibility of funeral directors and, and um, coordinators to walk us through that path. And I thought it was really, really cool that your film followed these, um, someone whose job it is to walk you through this process that as people who grew up overseas, we're not familiar with, right? We're not, we're not immersed by it. We don't know what, like, if my, if I had to go to like a Chinese funeral right now, I, I'd have no idea what to do. I need to be told what to read, what to say, what to do. Um, so um, on that end, your, your film really kind of touched me in kind of exploring the lives of people who do this for a living, who walk people through, connecting them to their heritage through death, right? So I guess what led you to choose this as a topic? And I understand that, um, you know, certain things happen in your film that I've given you permission to spoil. Um, and how did that change also the, the trajectory of your film as well? Sure, thanks for that. those really kind words. Um, I think definitely I echo what you feel about uh, I was so I was born in the U.S. My parents uh, migrated here as refugees, and I always had that fear, like, oh my gosh, if something happened, I literally have no idea what to do. And so when I met Julie, who's in the film, it was like the first time I met someone in my generation who, like, knew what to do because it's her job. Um, and uh, when I pitched the film to Brian, it was actually gonna be about her. Um, and so in the film, um, her father does pass away and, and we are given permission to follow her through that process. But that definitely wasn't what was initially planned. What was initially planned was, 
you know, a day in the life of someone who does something like this. And she also has a mentor who I follow briefly, uh, Do Tai Win, who is uh, pretty well known in the Vietnamese American community in San Diego. Um, and I think kind of, it was always going to be about Julie, um, because I think I didn't know what her life was like, but I knew that there was something about her and the way she expresses herself that I thought was going to be great, like in a film, because I don't know, some people just have that presence. Um, but yeah, so I think originally the film was going to be about her and her kind of day to day life. And then um, when things were happening with her father, I think we just really had to think on our feet and act kind of quickly. And I think a lot of that affected editing more than it did production. I think it definitely made our production go way faster than we thought. Um, but I think it really challenged us in the editing and I say us, but I mean, I edited it, <laughs> but, um, but my team helped me, you know, with, um, and I got a lot of feedback from a lot of people but it's just the tone of the film changed and it didn't quite change the way we shot it. It just changed how we were going to put it together. Yeah. I mean, um, I always wondered this about documentary filmmakers because they're following a story, but oftentimes stories happen as, as things happen as they follow the story. And especially with something that's kind of tragic or more on the tragic side. And I guess, you know, um, what what was that like to kind of to see the story forming? And did you was there any struggle in deciding whether or not you wanted to go this route as well? Because it was such it's a much more raw story to tell than what you were originally going for, right? Yeah, I mean, so this is my first professional documentary. So before I've made uh, like narrative films where I can sort of control. <laughs> what's happening more or less you know you can't control everything but you know it's scripted and so this is definitely a very different way of making films um but I think the fact that I lived so near the mortuary where mortuary where Julie works so it's on El Cajon I lived uh a block away from El Cajon so like from there to my apartment was like 10 minutes tops um seven if I'm fast and so I think that really helped in the kind of you know production um and the way that it was already set up with kind of a two-person crew so it was my DP Kayla and me and sometimes it was just me and Kayla uh, just me and Julie and I think that helped in the kind of like quickness that things were happening in because yeah a funeral happens like super fast and it definitely couldn't have been done if it wasn't for Julie's openness. And so she invited me in and we were able to film those things. And sometimes, you know, it was like, oh, are we gonna put this in? Are we not? I have like a lot of footage that wasn't in the film because, you know, we didn't know what was gonna happen, but definitely a huge exercise in endurance. And if, you know, our production office, AKA my apartment was not so near, uh, I think, it would have been harder. Great. All right, Joseph. Um, as a as a Chinese guy, I, I'm not familiar with karaoke bars as much as like karaoke like private rooms that we would like to go to. But karaoke is a one might say integral part of the Asian Asian in general identity because we love to sing in front of people. Um, it was really cool to see. Um, you know, you really felt like a fly on the wall at, at, at this karaoke bar that you you kind of immerse yourself in and get to know, you know, getting to know all the people and listening to the people, everyone sing and have a good time. Um, I guess my question for you would be, what did you have a personal connection to this karaoke bar already? What drew you to it? And um, why did you decide to make it your subject? Um. Yeah, so I, I've been there a few times uh, when I was younger, uh, when I was living in San Diego. Um, I didn't realize I had a connection to it until I found out one of the DJs was a, f a friend's dad from high school. So, um, um, yeah. Was that, was that the only question? Yet? Um, I mean, yeah. Like, how was... Um... Yeah. 
how was the experience of making this? I mean, so um, yeah, how was the how was your experience making this film? It it seems like you were, you know. What's the I mean, it was, it was it was really fun. I mean, Norbert could attest to this. Uh, I was there for like two months, a month, maybe a month and a half by myself, just hanging out and drinking and singing karaoke <laughs> with these guys. And then Norbert showed up for like a couple weeks um, there. Um, and basically that's all we did. <laughs> so how was, how did you get them to, and, oh, sorry. Uh, so how did you yet. get them to agree to be a part of this project, right? Were they, were they on board right away or were, did they like, were they suspicious? Like what were you trying to do? It's the... Yeah, so that's, I, I just showed up by myself one day and um, and then I just kept showing up for like a month and and then got to know them. And I, I was very transparent right from the beginning. You know, I told the owners, I told the um, the patrons that uh, that were regulars what I was doing. They introduced me to the, the DJs, the people that that would frequent it. And um, yeah, like I I pretty much just didn't show up with a camera and just bought them drinks every night or every weekend for like a good month or two and that's how I did it. <laughs> so so what point did Norbert show up with you Norbert I yeah, think actually, um you brought me in in January I think yeah so actually I wasn't planning on shooting at all like I was just doing pre-production and then I was like um at a certain point I got to know them like really well and I think if I like left because well, I'm from New York if I left back if I went back to New York and then came back I'm not sure if I would have I, I would I might have to like do the whole thing over again so I decided to just um Norbert has been shooting uh my stuff since we were in college so um I I gave him a call and I thought it'd be like a really good pro project for us to um work yeah on i mean it was it was a great it was great to experience um a side of san diego culture especially filipino san diego culture that i wasn't familiar with um as someone who mainly lived near uc san diego near mesa i rarely went south of downtown so um it was really cool to see like a part of san diego that i'm not as familiar with and um it was it was fun to hang out with you and norbert through the documentary with with all all the great people at the bar um was there anything that um didn't make it into your your film that that you kind of wanted to stick in um i mean there's there's definitely um but i not necessarily like a key piece that i wanted to it, it, it was really like when you're editing you know like you kind of have to get into a rhythm and a flow you know to see what works and what doesn't but um I I wouldn't say there was there's definitely like memories and 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 stuff that I cherish when when I look look through them again but not for the film necessarily okay. all right and RJ your film is um I'm assuming this is your graduating class that you interviewed for for this film yeah um I would say I, I I related to this because like so I grew up in a town where um, the minorities were the majority as well and so you know I think in my in my school um, the white kids were probably like twelve percent of the entire student population so a lot of what your um, classmates were talking about I did relate to in in, in a way because um, it feels like growing up in that kind of environment does prep you differently to to um to approach the world because for some reason you feel a little bit more confident in being in in your diversity as well yeah. um it's really it was really interesting to me because um you don't see san diego explored much as a border town or a border city um you know a lot of times when you think about border like um pieces set in border towns you think about texas el paso those borders but the san diego border is a big you know it's a big crossing area. Um, and um, I guess um, for, for your film, 
specifically you, you know, like how did, how did this film come together? What did it like, were, how did, what made you decide to interview your classmates about, about your reunion? Was it, was it for a reunion project or was it going to be like a documentary, like exploration from the beginning? It was going to be a documentary exploration from the beginning. Um, I think, I think the challenging thing though in, in producing this project was trying to figure out how many people I needed to interview, but also being mindful of the fact that our class is rather large. Um, I, think, I think the class of 99 was close to uh, 800, 800 folks. Wow. Is that a lot? <laughs> <laughs> um, it doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm misremembering, which is a thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I thought it just kind of was opportune uh, as Brian pitched his uh, project to me. I thought it would be uh, a great idea to kind of dig into my own personal history and interrogate it. Um, and what was really surprising uh, was some of the openness that a lot of the folks uh, presented um, in the interviews. I, I interviewed about maybe three married couples uh, from high school who stayed together and then um, and, and maybe a dozen in, uh, individuals. Um, but from the jump, like within the first 15 minutes of the first interview, the person sitting in the chair was, was crying and I was like, okay, um, there's something here. And throughout the interview process, day by day, uh, it just kind of felt like people just wanted to it to say number to say, but it, it also it felt like people uh, wanted to ask them how the last years it has been. And I don't know, I I I, I recommend that with anyone um and i'm like how are you and uh see how far you can get um yeah and i think that that was one of the amazing experiences of this project was to um was to just kind of bear witness hold space uh and listen and and kind of further complicate uh my understanding and anyone's understanding of what they thought San Diego is, was. Yeah. I mean, was there anything interesting that you learned, like anything that you surprised you from talking to your classmates about how, let's say, like growing up in a, a border area uh, affected their, how, how they viewed the world? I think, though, the one unsubstantiated claim was that there were several uh students at our high school and maybe in the south side of the of, of san diego who are, would, would kind of help smuggle people from across the border um wow. I, I wish i could dig into more of that that story um it seemed like it would be possible it would be a thing um especially in in the 80s and 90s when there's lore uh, of people like running through different backyards and the very south side of, of San Diego as they were crossing the border. Um, scenes of helicopters chasing people down. I mean, that was a thing in the 80s and 90s. Um, any other surprises? Um, that, that, that people still remember South San Diego fondly and that it's, you know, we were considered hood and ghetto, um, and I'm sure there's some truth to that, but there's also a lot of dignity um, in those neighborhoods too. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, you know, um, this omnibus focuses on San Diego and, and has four unique stories. Um, this is an open question for any of you. Um, are there any other stories about San Diego that you're interested in exploring? Um, that, you know, maybe it wasn't, it was, yeah, that you're interested in exploring if you, if Brian was to deign to give you another commission to, to do another project. I want to jump in. Um, I'm actually exploring it right now. Um, I want to do films on conservative Filipinos because <laughs> 
it fucking boggles my mind. And I have a lot of friends who happen to be conservative um, and I just don't get it. And I want to get it uh, kind of, but I also want uh, to challenge them. But yeah, Brian, hook me up. <laughs> Anybody else have any idea, any um, dream projects or anything they're working on? Or anything they'd like to other people to work on? Um, I can jump in. I think at one point before the pandemic happened and then I, you know, my whole life went like, <laughs> I, I thought that, wow, I would really like to explore um, more about uh, specifically Do Taiwan, who's in my film. She's a lady who does taxes and funerals. Um, and I had actually kind of pitched it to her and I was like, hey, <laughs> what if I expanded what I did about Julie and also include more of you? Because originally I, I, I meant to um, have more of her story in it anyway. So I definitely would sort of f follow the same line of thought about the funerals and especially now um, how that has changed. Um, but it could be me, it could be someone else, but I think that it is something that a longer form project can really uncover because ours is short film. So it was kind of done super quick, but I think that like a longer term, deeper dive would be really awesome. Yeah. Um, Ryan, as, as the San Diego Pack Arts Movement uh, artistic director, are there anything you want to see people explore around San Diego? Um, I'm just listening to everybody talk about these ideas, whether the films that they actually made or the films that they're thinking about. Like, I, I'm just so grateful that that these that these, this is even percolating at all. I mean, I, I think that um, once I, mean, I used to live in LA, where there's no shortage of ideas for movies. It seems like, if anything, it's, it's like there's too many ideas. Like, just go try someplace else. Um, but when you when you hear about this in San Diego, you realize like this is all such fresh terrain. So. I, I, yeah, it's everything feels feels new to me. I mean, it's, I mean, San Diego has a certain um, reputation for being like beaches and, I guess, burritos. <laughs> um, but I, I, everything else has not been in the movies, really. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm not too picky. In, in other words, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see, you know. San Diego is such a diverse place, but yeah, like RJ said, it's also a conservative city. It's like the conservative bastion of um, California next to, you know, Orange County. Um, and it'll be interesting. It's always, I'm always interested in other people's perspectives, even if I don't like believe in them. Um, it's interesting. I just, yeah, like RJ said, I just want to know why, because I, I don't know why neither. Um, but uh, I guess... Brian, um, sticking with you, how has so this um, film premiered last at last year's San Diego Asian Film Festival, and has made been making the festival circuit since then? Um, how has the response been in terms? And this is something everyone else can also um, answer if you have any experiences or something you want to say. But how has the response been to these stories? And anything surprising? Anything like you know, come to mind? Um, I mean, I think that the people who value it the most, maybe not surprisingly, are those in San Diego who have some connection with San Diego. I think for them, this is this is really precious to be able to, I mean, even Marvin, you said, like, you saw these images and it took you back somewhere. Um, and I mean, and that's why we love kind of Asian American cinema more, more broadly, but just to see a version of it that is um, kind of from your own neighborhood is really powerful. I actually love to hear from Joe on this, if I can ask Joe, because Joe just did a Q&A with his short, for the um, Asian American International Film Festival in New York. I mean, I'm curious what that conversation was like for you. Um, so I did a documentary panel and then a Q and A. Um, the documentary panel talked about um, more about community and like filming like in a particular community. And then the Q and A was it was a great Q and A, but it was a Q and A, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know what else to say. Uh, yeah, I, but people like. I mean, the thing is, my film is very much 
easy to digest in a way you know it has it, it has a way to like bring you in so i think that's that's the thing that um that 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 um that it has and then um so for the most part it's been well received in, in that way i will say like everybody i've talked to, like I've, I've heard a different person like a different have, have a different favorite like i like you know everyone's a different favorite of the four I think that speaks to um, the different ways in which these films have managed to connect with people through their styles, through their topics. So that, yeah. that's been satisfying. Yeah. And I think all of our films too, like have um, stuff underneath it that, 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 that that's more than what it, it really is, you know, on the surface level. Yeah. So I think that's what's great about it. So Francis is interested in learning. Are, 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 do you, have you kept in touch with the karaoke place? Like, how are they doing in this time of COVID? Yeah, so that, the manage, so when we did the uh, the, the, the world premiere at PACARS last year, the owners were, were there and um, they informed me that they sold the place. Oh. Um, and and um, so it's not the same place, but I think the, I haven't been since, but I think the regulars are still there. But so, but I'm not sure. Can someone in San Diego check for me? It's, it, I think it's called like Philippine Islands now. It's not. It used to be called Capo. Um, uh, I hope everyone's doing well. I I got a few texts from um, the people that I keep in touch with, and they seem to be doing okay. Yeah, but I would love to go back there and and and, and sing again and eat their coconut food. I do miss karaoke. I don't think I've been in the last. How long has we been? How long have we been in lockdown now? Eight months. Can we just months? stop this and do karaoke? <laughs> I'm down if you all like, are down on, on Zoom. <laughs> it's everyone's go-to song. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess I'm curious. What are y'all been working on since? Um, over over the the lockdown um are you you know anything coming up that that should be on our radar um let's start with uh norbert anything you're working on so i'm working on two projects uh i'm still working on a feature length documentary called preserves and it's it's a food based documentary about a journey of an ingredient in taiwan and it's kind of like taking the idea of food to table and following um, agriculture, you know, field laborers, the farmer, and then the restaurant owner. So that, that's that been an eight-year process now. So now I'm in post. I mean, wow. documentaries just take so long and so many resources. So I, you know, I was supposed to go to a retreat earlier in the year and edit, but that, you know, mm. was uh, put on hold. Um, and then I'm working on another short documentary um, that's I get, it's part of a group screening for 20 artists, like 20 artists about 2020. So, um, you know, it's a home movie about life during COVID. So I'm sh doing, I'm editing that and trying to get that done by the end of the month for the group show, group, group screening. So yeah, yeah, keep an eye out for it. Should be interesting. Yeah, congrats on making it the post on that documentary. Um, yeah. I'm partial to food content, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, Kuen, um, how about you? Uh, I'm going to report that the pandemic has definitely thrown my life into chaos. So those who know, know how my life has changed. Sorry to be so vague. <laughs> um, but in terms of projects, I have a lot that are on hold. And I hope that, you know, this isn't, I don't know, I'm not going to be morbid. It's not the end of my filmmaking but being in this pandemic has been very tough um, on me personally um, mm -hmm. and for my family. So I think what will emerge eventually is something that looks inward. Um, but that's all I can say <laughs> for now. I have a lot of old footage of baby wing running around <laughs> is what I'm experimenting with. Well, hang in there. Uh... Thanks. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> for I mean, love everyone. Just trying to keep it real. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, 
your work's always great. So we're looking forward to whatever comes next. Uh, Joseph, how, how about you? Anything coming up? Yeah, the thing that I think that made me realize what the pandemic is like, how um, like filmmaking is such a luxury, you know? So I totally agree with um, you and that there's more important things. Um, but I am trying to finish a documentary just like Norbert that I've been working on for five years. And hopefully it will be done or released next year. Cool. Any hints on what it's about? Yeah, it's uh, it's called Holy Craft, or actually, the title might change, but um, uh, it's it's about this factory in the in just on the outskirts of Manila, and they make um, saint statues, like Catholic saint statues, and um, like. A lot of the a lot of the workers are comprised of LGBTQ and outcasts, and they pray to the same items that they make. Um, so, so I was doing that for like five years. Uh -huh. uh, Joe's being modest. He his, this film won the uh, Doc in Progress Prize at the Cannes Film Festival this summer. So oh, wow. a lot of people are very excited about this. <laughs> yeah, there's some some news that I don't. That, that that's coming up that's uh, <laughs> that might be interesting for some people here yeah congratulations i guess <laughs> i'm a, I, i'm i'm excited about that news um rj anything besides that uh conservative filipino film project yeah i'm i'm in talks with a with another filmmaker friend and um thinking about jumping onto a cruise ship long form documentary mm -hmm. uh multi-year project um i went on a my first cruise maybe like two years ago at this point from canada to alaska and i was just tripping the whole time <laughs> um i mean i brought weed yes but i was also just tripping on the the realities um on that on that ship uh, and also making so many stops in alaska and just tripping out on the alaska daros and the filipinos that were there before us, um, wild, wild. So I'm on that. But much like Ween, like this shit is like sending me through a spiral. Um, my only recourse has been my dog, my wife, uh, running kettlebells and now uh, a fixie. I'm like, I'm turning 40 this year and I'm trying to ride a fixie, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, I'm just reading readying my body for the potential uh, fallout, whatever, however y'all want to interpret that. Well, likewise, hang in there. Um, it's good to see you're working on, on a bunch of stuff. That cruise ship project sounds really interesting. It's, I, I went on my first cruise uh, two years ago as well. And yeah, it was, it was weird. It was fun, I guess, but it was weird. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, we're coming up on our hour, so I had one more question, but, um, well, let's go with Brian first. Uh, Brian, uh, what can we expect from Pack Arts this weekend, I guess? Yeah, um, tomorrow begins San Diego Asian Film Festival. Um, we actually, like, printed out stuff, like, we have booklets, um, <laughs> Uh, we're, we're just trying to like, maybe we're just trying to uh, fool ourselves into thinking it's, it's regular times, but we're learning a lot from, from the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival, from CAMFest, from, for all the other festivals who have had to figure out what an online film festival is. And we're trying to have fun with it, um, doing little like Twitch streams and pretending like, I, I, and, and tr trying to figure out what, um, what we could do now that we couldn't have before. And we're learning a lot already um, about <laughs> Um, not just what an online film festival is, but maybe like what we as Pacific Arts Movement based in San Diego can be locally, regionally, and nationally. Um, yeah, a, a lot of movies. <laughs> yeah, good luck to you and your team there. Um, and I guess my, my last question to all of you to, to end on would be um, this project, um, this omnibus came together because of support from Pacific Arts Movement. Um, you all are beneficiaries or have been beneficiaries of a lot of programs by orgs like Pack Arts, orgs like VC. I know um, um, three of you have been part of VC's Art with the Camera uh, Fellowship as well. Um, 
any parting words to anyone who is listening or will listen to this panel on just how to take advantage of the resources that our community can give like, and how, how that has affected your, your, your filmmaking careers as well. Um, any, I guess, pieces of advice or wisdom. Uh, I would say believe in your communities, like really, like we're all underdogs at this point um, and we really need to rally together. Um, and that could look very different for, uh, that could be interpreted and look very different for different folks. Um, but yeah, if not for PAC Arts, this project would not have gotten made, but without VC, I would not be a filmmaker, like straight up. I think I was either third or fourth class in AWC. So wild, y'all got crazy budgets now and high production value, way above the high eight video or whatever mini DV we had back then. I feel like RJ said it all. Um, I, I think definitely some one of the morbid things I heard in this pandemic is that we hope we don't lose a whole generation of filmmakers of color because, you know, there's no support and the support was so far a few and far in between before and I think I was very I couldn't have been a filmmaker without the support of my community so whether that be Pack Arts or VC or CAM I feel like I've been supported by many uh, institutions and there's you know no one can make a film on their own and sometimes there's like a I don't know, a weird Hollywood auteur thing where you're like the brilliant genius, but that kind of erases the community that holds you up. And so I hope that we can all keep supporting each other and the people like who are feeling like me, <laughs> like that this is the end of our filmmaking, that we like just let that be a bad thought and let our community pull us through it. Anybody else? Yeah, I totally wouldn't have been able to be a filmmaker if it wasn't for Pack Arts or VC. They supported me like ever since grad when I graduated from college. So definitely, um, but not enough. Definitely, that supports um, Asian American filmmakers. So um, we need more <laughs> for sure. Just to like wrap up, I think filmmaking by far with this pandemic has been very clear a process of taking a village you know it just takes so much to make a film and without communities like you guys bc and pack guards i think you know it'd just be hard to get the voice out and they they just do so much work to amplify and also educate i think a lot of it is they go hand in hand and just building that community getting the word out so important so um thank you guys again and if you're out there, you know, just just know how important it is. Just find your tribe, find your peoples, especially even at a time like this, you know, during COVID, either virtually or just like when it's done, finding people you can work with and collaborate. Yeah. And with that, I think that's a good place to end this panel on. Thank you so much to our panelists for joining us. Um, their films can be found in the omnibus uh, package, The Paradise We're Looking For, that's available now, screening until Sunday night. Um, by go you can check it out by going to festival.vcmedia.org um, and checking out the schedule there. Um, oh, the link is also in the chat if you're interested. Um, check out San Diego Asian Film Festival that's opening this weekend. Um, Brian and the team, um, good luck. Um, I, we're there with you <laughs> in spirit. Um, and um, thank you so much for joining us for this panel. Um, if you enjoyed this conversation and the festival lineup, please consider donating to Visual Donating to Visual Communications, your support help will help us sustain our year-round operations and programming. Um, go to vcmedia.org for, uh, for more info. And we hope to see you at another conversation. We have a full slate of conversations um, tomorrow and Saturday. Uh, for the most recent updates on the festival, please visit festival please visit our website at festival.vcmedia.org or follow us on social media accounts um, at VC Film Festival and follow us on the, with the tag LAAPFF2020. 
Um, everyone, once again, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Um, it was great just to chat with you about your films and San Diego. Um, Brian, always a pleasure um, um, hanging out with you. And thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the festival. Bye, everyone. <laughs>